All right, guys, um, the last chapter that we did was uh, relatively short. Um, this one is a longer chapter, and so we're going to dig right in, um, chapter 25 of Jeremiah, and let's go ahead and invite God's presence here. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, and we invite you to join us, Lord God, that your spirit would be here and just work through us and have your way and speak through me. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word and what you have for us in Jesus' name. All right. So verse 1 of chapter 25. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So... We have a nice treat, um, as was with the last chapter, that we actually give a time, we're given a time frame of when this took place. And so um, it was uh, what it said. So this is uh, chapter 25 actually takes place way before 24. This is going way back. Um, in 24, uh, we learned that that... Um, message from God took place after um, Babylon had already taken over and then took captives away back to Babylon. So what happened was the prophets would come and prophesy for the people to repent or God was going to remove his hand of protection from them and the enemies would come and invade. The people didn't listen and didn't listen and didn't listen. As time went on, Babylon came and besieged it. That means that they set up around it, um, didn't let anyone go out or come in, would cut off their water supply, different stuff that was like, you know, they're kind of like getting towards, uh, we're going to capture you. We're going to try and wait for you to kindly surrender. But in the meantime, we're just going to starve you to death and, and make you die of thirst and all this other stuff. Um, we're just going to camp out around you and not let you move freely. And so that goes on for, that can go on for a disclosed amount of time, what armies did. And that could go on for years. And so then it was after that, then the, they just break in and take it over and then haul you off. So we're told here in chapter 25 right now off the bat that this word came to Jeremiah and it was about all the people of Judah. That was in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim is now the king. His father was Josiah. And so this is the fourth year of his reign, which is the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieging it. So it hasn't taken over yet. He's just kind of like, you know, poking the bear and trying to start trouble with Israel at this point, the first year in. So they haven't invaded yet or anything like that. I'm just trying to give you, you know, an idea in your mind. Verse 2, the which Jeremiah the prophet spoke unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, that is the 23rd year, the word of the Lord has come unto me. And I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. So Jeremiah prophesied all through the rest of Josiah's reign and now into the next kingdom, and the, excuse me, the people will not listen. And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor opened your ears to hear. They said, turn ye again now, every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and live in the land that the Lord has given to you and to your fathers forever and ever. It's really a no-brainer. Just God gave you this land, so you need to abide by what he's telling you to do, or he'll take it away. It's that simple. Verse 6, 
and go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not listened unto me, saith the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants of it and against all the nations round about it and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Two things we got to remember in this verse, that destruction, as we talked about, and it keeps repeating, keeps repeating, keeps repeating, that when the judgment of God comes to a person or a place, it also comes to everyone around them. Okay? So... Then secondly, we talked about this before, God will often say that he will make them an astonishment and a hissing. And we learned that that is, um, was in the Hebrew, um, the noise that you make when you shudder and you're in shock, like the, that's, so it's not our hissing like a snake or something that we use in the English language, but in the Hebrew, it was um, what we call in the English language, onomatopoeia which is a word like bang, pop. It's the sound that the word makes a sound. And so that hissing was, hissing is the sound it makes when you shudder. And you're caught by surprise, and it's not a good thing. That when people would go through the land and see how demolished and everything, the devastation, they would just be shocked and speechless. And that's what God would do if they continue to rebel. Verse 10, moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, that's celebration, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of millstones and the light of the candle. Gosh, that is a lot. So he's going to take away all their anything that would ever make them happy, they're not going to have. There's going to be no cause for celebration. They're going to be utterly devastated and just depressed. And he said, I'm going to take away the sound of the millstone. Millstones were used to make bread and corn and different things. The women would use it. And those were common sounds and you're not getting that anymore. So their everyday life, common everyday life was never going to be the same again. Just utter dev devastation. They would not have their basic needs. And then finally, even worse than that is that God would take away the light of the candle. So they wouldn't have oil. They wouldn't have anything. They wouldn't be able to see. Once the night fell, it was utter darkness. And that's all that they would have in the land for continuing to rebel. Verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. You don't always get a time frame, but they did. You know, like Joseph in Egypt, poor guy, did not have a time frame of when he was going to come out of prison. But sometimes you do get a time frame, <clears throat> excuse me, and they did. It was 70 years that they would be led away captive into Babylon. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations and I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations and so you might say you know a good question to ask would be well if a couple of verses ago God said I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar my servant to come take you away 
And then when 70 years is up, now I'm going to punish him for having you captive. That may sound on the surface as, um, you know, something that didn't make sense. Um, but the reason that they're going to be punished and you're going to see, that's why context is so important as we go on the chapter, you're going to understand more why. So, okay, sometimes God would re remove his hand of protection off his people and let the enemy come and take over. Okay, you do your thing. But there were some times when God lifted that hand of protection, the enemy came in and did horrid, outlandish things that God never intended for them to do, never sanctioned for them to do. Um, you got the Assyrians and they would come in and, and rip pregnant women open and, and rape women and do all that and, and child sacrifice and all this hor these horrible, horrible things. And so there are times when people, when we may not understand, I, I did another video on this where we don't understand why bad things happen and why people are in position of power or in any type of upper hand and they're evil and horrible and they're allowed to get away with this for so long and you don't understand why. But there is coming a point of reckoning. It doesn't matter how long they were able to get away with doing things. They are going to answer at some point for what they did. And so that's why it's saying that after the 70 years, God is then going to punish Babylon and he's going to go on with it. It's a lot more in Babylon. All the nations, you're going to find just how sad and sick that all these nations that took advantage of Israel and took over her and just um, just did horrible, horrible things and their treatment of her. At some point, God is like, okay, I've had enough. Like, I let you do, you know, what you want and come in here and take over, but you have crossed a line and it's time to pay the piper. You can't be doing this to people. Sometimes you give people an inch and they take a mile, you know, and that's what was happening. God gave these people an inch and they, they went way off base with it. And God was like, okay, now you're, you're going to have to answer. When people um, manipulate and con and take advantage of people, God is never pleased with that. And you will answer for what you've done. That is just not acceptable. And so I just wanted to explain that thing. It may seem like um, a contradiction, but um, it is definitely not. So verse 13, God goes on and says, um, oh, we read that, that he was going to bring it all, that he promised, that he pronounced that Jeremiah had prophesied against all the nations. Verse 14, for many nations, he's explaining why now. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. When it, you serve yourself, you, um, I'm trying to find the words for it, but you serve yourself, you manipulate people and you use them for your own advantage and your own profit. Okay. And you take advantage of people. So you, they're going to serve themselves of them also. And I will repay them according to their deeds and according to the work of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword I will send among them. You see that a lot where people rebel against God and don't do according to his word. And then he punishes them and then they get mad at him. You know, and so that's what's going to happen here. God said, verse 17, then I took the cup, Jeremiah says, at the Lord's hand and made all nations to drink it unto whom the Lord had sent me. Now, what happened with this? This is what we don't know. This is kind of curious. Like, is this a thing where Jeremiah symbolically went to nations? Maybe did he stand there and hold a cup to them or, you know, they're going to go on. But was this symbolically or did he actually do this or to what extent was this done? We don't know, but um, it's out there. So 
Um, so Jeremiah took this, the cup that God had gave him, and he went to all the nations that God told him to go to. And now Jeremiah is going to list all those places that God sent him to. Verse 18, Jerusalem, the cities of Judah and their kings, the princes of it, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing, and a curse as it is this day. To Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to his servants, his princes, all his people, all the mingled people, all the kings of the land of Uz, the kings of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon, and Azah, Ekron, the remnant of Ashdod. Edom, Moab, the children of Ammon, the kings of Tyrus, all the kings of Zidon, and the kings of the isles that are beyond the sea, Dadon, Tama, Buzz, and all that are in the utmost corners, all the kings of Arabia, all the kings of the mingled people that live in the desert, the nomads were even taking advantage of Israel and mistreating them, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, all the kings of the Medes. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, all the kingdoms of the world that are on the face of the earth, the king of Shishak will drink after them. Man, all those people, all those nations at some point or another mistreated Israel and took advantage of her. And now God is going to pay them back. So that's another thing, too, to remember that just because someone is currently not in a right standing with God doesn't mean you get to touch them. So Israel was backslidden, and that is the love and the mercy of God, that even when they're backslidden off doing crazy things, you are not, God will call you into account because his heart is still with them. His heart is still with them, and you cannot be doing that to people. Okay, so it was something very interesting to, to see just the love of God, no matter where he still got his eye on you, even when you're away from him. Verse 27, therefore, you shall say to them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink ye and be drunken and spit and fall and rise no more because of the sword that I will send among you. And it shall be that if they refuse to take the cup at your hand to drink it, then you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall surely drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished? You shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, hallelujah, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, and as they that tread the grapes against all the people of the earth, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. A great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day. From one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. My God in heaven. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. I wish that people would understand that there is a time of reckoning with the Lord and you cannot go unpunished so many times we want to think that God is some hippie that's just all love 
and we can do whatever we want and he just understands and accepts whatever and that is hogwash. We will be held accountable for these things. Verse 34, howl you shepherds and cry. Wallow yourselves in the ashes, you principal of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished and you will fall like a pleasant vessel, shattered and broken. And the shepherds will have nowhere to flee, nor the principle of the flock to escape. Okay, the principle of the flock was the best, the favored ones. So we know that these shepherds, that's what you do. You favor, you got your little clicks. Well, you're caught up in that. You're going in the punishment too. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and a howling of the principle of the flock shall be heard. For the Lord has spoiled their pasture. And the peaceable habitations, all their nice places that they lived and took shelter, are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He has forsaken his covert as the lion. So his hiding place, his people, his land, he has forsaken it. For their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. This is why that these things have come because these people refuse to obey God and submit to him and follow his ways. After they've taken the goodness out of his hand, they took his blessings, they took his kindness, they took his mercy, and now they don't want nothing to do with him. You can't do that. You can't do that. And so whatever God gave them, since it's his, he has the right to take it away. If you don't care, if you're going to be disrespectful, that's common sense in in dealings among people. If I give you things and you're going to just disrespect me and, you know, act sideways, then um, I'm going to take it back and I'm not giving you anything anymore. And that's going to be it until you rectify the relationship. That's how it's going to be. And so the things that God is expecting of people is not too much to ask. We live in his world. We breathe his air. We eat his food. This is his place. This is, He runs the show. And if you don't like it, then you go off and make your own thing, which you can't. So too bad. You have to submit to those rules. God is amazing. And God is love. And he has the best things for us if we will submit and surrender to him. And I hope in the name of Jesus Christ that you will do that. I hope you have a good night. And we're coming into the new year. I hope you have a great new year. I hope you draw close to God this year. He speaks to you and shows you things. I hope in the name of Jesus Christ that the things that you've been praying for and waiting for, that this is their fulfillment. I speak good things over you this year. In the name of Jesus Christ, have a good day. Bye-bye.